Hey folks, welcome to November's video of creating a fantasy environment dreamscape islands. I uh, just want to first say to you all thank you for subscribing to my Patreon. It really goes a long way in helping me to keep on making this art and make it more sustainable. Um, as you know, I work for a lot of studios. I, work, I do freelance for a lot of people in studios, but being able to make it my own stories and having support from patrons like yourself really makes um, gives me more balance and allows me to um, focus on making original content. Um, and not, I still work when I work for clients and I do love working for clients, but it just allows me to, I suppose, make original designs and my own stories, which is what I've been wanting to do for years. Um, anyway, without further ado, I'll stop. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, it's and for, the, for a great year as well to everyone that's been supporting me since April and for those even those that are new and um, yeah so what I've got here is just want to talk about things first is a thumbnail this was just a, a thumbnail sketch that I put together I did a whole series of thumbnails in um, I suppose it was with I, I did it over one a few days but I had a session at Google Hangout and had another concept designer, Joshua Calloway, he joined in and we put together a tutorial video well I just started doing the thumbnails and you get, you all get the actual thumbnail movie as well and you see how I created this um, thumbnail design and there was a whole bunch of other ideas and the whole idea was I was trying to create you know hovering islands or kind of like James Cameron's avatar or, or like Zendikar from Magic the Gathering, kind of get this hovering dreamscape islands. Um, it's kind of a very surreal dream world. Like this is a place that exists in the real world of, of Equatoria. Um, and it also exists in the dream plane in Luminous Ages. But um, yeah, it's just, all I'm doing here is I'm planning up a grayscale thumbnail sketch. And, and I, as you can see, even my thumbnail, you can see all the layers on the right hand side. I actually layer everything, um, which is pretty cool. Um, I like doing that because even a lot of people when they do thumbnails, they just do it all together. Like they kind of just paint, and that's cool, there's nothing wrong with that. But eventually, to, to, to speed things up, it's a good idea to kind of, it, it might, might take you a bit longer in making the thumbnail, but the good thing about it is it allows you to kind of say, hey, if I do choose this thumbnail design, it's already in layers, I can then go into painting and cleaning it up and get it ready for an illustration. So, um, also the idea I wanted to have is this ancient, archaic kind of world, uh, dream world, so it's kind of surreal, you know, there's this sphinx here, it's an Athenian sphinx, I believe, and the Egyptian sphinx in the foreground as well. And, oh sorry, it's all part of that central island, which is the focus focal point. And the whole idea was like, hey, um, I'm going to grab this design and and make, make give it this surreal, this surreal kind of element, the dreamlike sensation, you know, like why is this kind of ancient sphinx thing hovering on top of, <laughs> in on on this piece of land, so to speak, and why is it, um, you know, you know, why is it there? And and I suppose there is a story behind it. You know, I've actually thought of the story myself. Um, and this story is part of the comic book, which I can't reveal until you start reading the comic. Um, and because I'm not here to do any spoilers, but um, you know, this environment was part of the ages, so it was. It just worked out that people wanted everyone voted for Dreamscape and Island, so I painted it. So as you can see, what I'm doing here is I'm using the select tool. I'm using the marquee tool. Um, it's like the polygon select tool, and I'm drawing selections and. What that allows you to do with digital painting is actually really create crisp edges and crisp lines. You can see that I'm painting off the river, I'm gonna paint a river in the background. And um, and the benefit of that is, and I'm using mainly a hard brush with a bit of texture on it, usually like a hard round brush with a textured effect. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have like, I try and put my brush windows into this screen as often as I can, but it's hard because you know, I want to have the layers, I want to have um, the, the tools on the side and the colour palette visible, but, um, you know, it's hard for me to show you. I mean, I, I do scroll down a bit and I show you all the brushes in a sec later on, but but anyway, the point is, um, I just use a hard brush, a very hard brush to create crisp edges, just to refine 
where everything is. It's better to start off in a digital painting. It's always better to start off with hard edges and everything. You can always soften things up, but it's always harder to sharpen things up. Um, you can do a sharpened adjustment filter, but to get that really crisp edge, it's sometimes it's better to just paint it. And that's why it's better to paint everything sharp um, and stuff. So I'm just using a brush here. I use the dual brush setting. Um, all the, a lot of the time when I'm creating texture, well, I'm trying to suggest texture even in this rough sketch. If I was to present something like this to a client, I usually present, I mean, this isn't, I don't, I mean, I present a whole bunch of thumbnails first to clients. They pick a thumbnail, but usually what I do is I actually, now with like really high-end fantasy clients, I wouldn't even show them all my thumbnails. I Like say the 10 designs that I have, I wouldn't show them that. What I would do is I, and this is just some advice for, for those of you that are aspiring artists, is I would, I think a little bit further down the track, like let's say I refine this design and I've got four designs like this that I think are solid designs. I send those designs with a bit more detail to the editor or to the art director, whoever I'm working with, to the author. Um, because usually something that's too rough it's, it leaves, it's open to interpretation. And, you know, people can, a, a client can turn around and say, hey, look, it's not what I expected. So it's better to give them something with a bit more detail with thumbnails. And I'll show you, I'll explain at what point I do that. Like I'll show you at what point I send it off. I'll just go, and now this is where I send it off. <laughs> but um, I wouldn't send it off just now. This is just still working out the lighting, really. Um, Right now, I've figured out, okay, there's going to be writing coming from the top, lighting coming from the top right in this. And, um, you know, uh, and, I, and I've got to get rid of all the pencil lines too. Like, this was all penciled out digi digitally. So, like, you know, you don't want to have, I mean, you can leave a suggestion of pencil. Some editors like that, or some directors want that. Um, they love to see pencil lines. You know, for, but that's at, usually at a very, 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 very early stage in concept design. So what I'm doing is I'm just painting it all in grayscale, you know, and in grayscale you can work out the lighting, you can work out the composition, you can play around with it, and you can see that back background island um, that's holding the wall, it's kind of being held up by one structure. I have really gone in and, sorry about that, that's my phone. <laughs> my phone has all sorts of uh, Lord of the Rings ringtones and stuff, so um, if you hear it ringing, or you hear like some weird sounds, it's just my... Lord of the Rings phone. I'm a big fantasy buff, so as you probably gathered with all my work, uh, sometimes it's in Star Wars uh, message tones I use as well. But, um, but anyway, so um, yeah, so as you can see, I'm just basically painting over the design and working out, still playing around with the forms and the shapes. You know, sometimes it's like a lot of people they, you know, I, they they don't they just go with the first sketch. I, even with the thumbnail, I just work it out more. As you can see, I flip the canvas there to see, does this work, does this look cool? And yeah, it does. Looking at this, there's something about the essence of the original design. See, this is the thing. The end design does look really cool, and it does, it, 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 it looks very believable, but there, even this concept design, this rough, that left plane that I'm painting on right now, um, where I'm putting that shadow, it looks cooler in this version than the, than the finish. Oh, it still looks good in the finish, but, you know, like, it's, it's just something got lost, you know, like, not in a bad way, but it's just like, it's a problem, like, when you do rough concept art, it's very different to finish illustration, and you always have to be aware of that, you know, because, like, you know, if you're doing concept designs, let's say I submitted this as a concept for a video game, as a rough concept, um, you know, this is usually totally different to a finished illustration. Do you know what I mean? So um, you just got to be wary of that. But that's what you know when you're doing designs. You, you have to be wary of that. You know. So um, sorry for the sound effects. But um, yeah. So it's just a matter of going. Hey, look. You know, I. You know, you've got to kind of just understand that concept design and illustration, concept art, is usually rough, really sketchy stuff like this, and that's a concept and it's done. But then when you go to illustration, which will turn it into an illustration, things change, you know, the essence of the changes, the lighting, the mood, everything changes. So, you know, concept design, sometimes you might have a whole series of concept pieces like this, and this is enough for a 3D model to go on and make a level for a game design. Um, 
you know some people need more information but even so even if you add just a little bit more like color and texture and you render in the lighting you still get that you that, that left island on the left uh, will still look like that you know but the illustration it changes dramatically um, so yeah here you can see how separated everything in layers it's really important to do that um, I do it in my thumbnails uh, like I said I've worked on so many designs for clients and sometimes like you know it's funny because when I do thumbnails I do work in that because it allows me to separate the values and create that focal point from the straight from the start and when you're creating a design it's really important you know your darkest darks and your lightest lights are going to create contrast and contrast creates focus uh, and in this case it's, that's what I end up doing to the sphinx structure the sphinx island we call it is I add all my darkest darks there and my lightest lights there so that the viewer is drawn towards there you can have blacks and greys together you can have greys and whites together but as soon as you have say a, a white and a black white and even greys together a dark greys together or blacks your focus starts to distract you, you know your viewer doesn't look at the focal point which is the sphinx in this case and for those of you that want to know you know how long did this illustration take me look you know it was i had i did this in the, during uh, two conventions between Adelaide Supernova and Brisbane Supernova um, so there was like three days in between those two conventions so three days every week between the con I had three days where I could paint one day was for packing and the other day was for organizing orders and stuff for, for people that ordered my art and here I am I'm just painting the river but it took me like three days six days and then I spent another three so I reckon this piece probably took me nine days or ten days so roughly two weeks um, you can get it down to a full week um, what, what reason why it probably took me ten days is because I traveling going to conventions being tired taking a day off here and there you know it does take it out of you um, and sometimes you can get a painting done like, like this completed in a week but really like if you really want to push a painting to the level maybe a couple of weeks um, it doesn't matter if you're still learning and you're starting out I would say don't worry about time um, you know if a painting if, if you're like I, I remember when I started out my portfolio pieces I was doing one good portfolio piece a month that's it and it's kind of paused here so I think I'm just adding in the river suggesting the river in the background you know but, um, to give it that sense of depth yeah, I'm looking at this grey stone, I'm like, yeah, this is pretty cool. <laughs> I like it better than the colour. Now, I think the colour was good in the end. I was happy with the end result. Um, like, still, I'm probably going to spend another day. I mean, it's all done for you all, and the video is done for you all. But, you know, I'd probably still spend a day just um, adding details um, to it for my portfolio. You know, like, I'd probably spend another day of college. So, really, you know, it's two full weeks. You know, I've spent, like, eight days at the moment full time on it but you know really it's 10 days by the time I, I sit down and go okay I really want to make this a portfolio piece um, to submit to say Magic the Gathering or Fantasy Flight Games so I'm constantly submitting to clients new work um, you know you really need to invest the time to make it really that stellar, stellar good because it, what a client's going to expect is it's either going to your, your work that they hire you for it's going to be the quality you submit or a little bit less so you really want to blow them out of the water and make it amazing because even if they get a little bit less than what you show them in your portfolio, they're still going to be happy and the job's still going to be good. Because think like things like life happens or deadlines happen and stuff. So you really need to when you do work professionally, you do have to work a little bit faster. You know, I I mean I push out. I wouldn't say push out, but I create a painting every week. I can finish illustrations every week if I have no comic conventions to go to. Even if I have to do that, I will, like a, I have to finish a painting in a week. Um, I can take a tablet with me and paint at a con or in the hotel and stuff and get my work done. Um, and that's what I'm going to be doing next year. As I said, a bit, I'll probably save a little bit more money early in the year. And I'm going to buy a wake, like not a wake and tablet, but I'll probably buy a Surface Pro to do my painting everywhere. And I don't, I don't advise you all to. To do that like I advise you to kind of save your money get away from the tablet first practice on that um, you know because I, I just hope the Wacom Cintiq companion is going to be good you know 
Um, so I hope the surface pro is good because otherwise I'm going to have to go buy some seat companion as well. <laughs> so it just takes time to figure out what tools work for you. So here I am just playing with the foreground, painting in the foreground details. See, I would probably say like at this point, this could be a, a rough concept, a rough idea that you would send. I would probably just do a bit of a, like a color. I'd add a little bit of color. I'd send them this, a grayscale version, and then I'd send a color version as well, but I'd do them together. So they get the rough black and white, and then they get the rough color sent to them. Um, and then the director would say to me, or you know, the author, whatever the client is, would say, hey, look, um, change this or change that. As you can see, what I did there is I played around with the contrast um, I, to create more focus on into the Sphinx. Um, so, and, and also, everything design-wise is pointing and leading to the focal point. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, the, the, the island on the left is pointing, it looks kind of like a, death, a, a spaceship or whatever. It's pointing to the Sphinx. The island in the background is directly linking to the, to the, um, the Sphinx. The islands, the, the hovering stuff at the top and the side is pointing to the focal point. And that's all purposely done. So that's the other thing, like you can use design and form to create focus. And it's like an old, it's an old school technique, I suppose old school foundational principle, you know, creating focus um, toward an art school. So you can see that I play around with that. I think I get I, I either change it or make that smaller. There is one of the islands in the top left and that gets deleted. What's funny is I flip this canvas this way, um, but like like now looking at this design, I'm like, you know, it could have been, um, it, it could have worked this way. I flipped it at the moment like this so that you could focus in, I could actually see my errors. You can flip the canvas um, all the time to just see what's wrong, you know, with the perspective or with the design and everything. And um, kind of looking at this design, I reckon, I really reckon it looks cool like this. Like you could flip it this way and it still would look cool as a design. And that's good. Like you know, you've got a really good painting when. I mean, obviously, you've got something with signage that's going to affect things dramatically. But you know, you've got a really, really, really cool painting when. Um, you get um, you, you flip the canvas and it still looks cool. Doesn't matter, you know. If it's, it's, uh, you know, if it's flipped horizontally, it looks cool. So I'm just using the textures brush to texture things here. And here I play with values of every single layer. And this is why having everything in lasers is really handy. I use levels adjustment and I pull out blacks like those islands, those islands in the background. They you know, they're either going to have the one on the left is going to be a bit more darker and the one on the right is going to be a bit lighter because it's further away. It's going to have less blacks. And that's called atmospheric, in environment design, that's called atmospheric perspective. So it's really important to, it's really important to actually remember that those things are really important. Um, atmospheric, atmospheric perspective in concept design is like the number one thing to to really create depth in a painting. And what that means is as things recede in the background, the darks disappear, um, or they, they, they have more blue because they're reflecting the light in from the, from the sky. And yeah, they have blue light. I suppose it's just um, they have a blue hazy look. And you could always look at, say, to understand atmospheric perspective, go and sit on the top of a mountain and look at mountains in the distance. You've got mountains in the, in the foreground that will have um, they have, say, you know, green. But as you get, as you uh, go further and further away, you know, you can see um, actually. As you go further and further away, you basically have, um, I suppose, more and more blue haze to, to your your mountains or whatever it is. And so you'd have less blacks, you have less darks. You can still have very light colours or whites in the background of the painting of a landscape. Usually you have um, a lot of blues or haze um, because as things recede, 
they just lose lose contrast, you know. And but I would I would urge you to look up atmospheric perspective to understand the importance of it. Um, it's like one of the main um, things you've got to always remember when you're doing concept design. You know, does this have enough atmospheric pers perspective? Do you know? And when you when you're drawing and painting, like you can see here, I'm, I'm noodling, I'm cutting into this design, I'm cleaning it up. You know, you really want to create focus. You know, and the way you're going to create focus is with atmospheric perspective. <laughs> Here I'm deciding what to do with the mouth. Ends up that the water is pouring out of this Egyptian sphinx's, um, I suppose, um, out of his mouth. You know, that's where a waterfall is going to fall out of, and there's a waterfall on the other side of the actual design. Yeah, so here I'm just playing around with it, making sure each of the plane works. And can you see there? There's actually a perspective grid. Um, I provide that in the PSD, so if you want to pull that out of my Photoshop file, you've got it, it's yours. It's all yours. So, I'm generous like that. I like to give it away as much of my stuff as I can to help people out. Yeah, but, you know, a lot of artists are like, oh no, I don't want to give that away, don't give this stuff away, you know, this, these are my brushes or these are my, you know, these are my, my tools and stuff, whatever I use. You know, the, the, the problem, the issue, the issue I have with that is that, you know, no, everyone, you're not me, you know, you you might have my brushes, you might have my tools, my digital settings, whatever, but you, you are not going to paint a picture like me. Everyone paints stuff in their own unique way, you know, and there's, there's not, no right or there's no wrong, you know, you know, a lot of people get caught up with not giving away their stuff because they're like, oh no, you know, they're going to copy me, you know, <laughs> you can try copy me. I, it would be an honor, honor, you know. But um, but um, yeah. You can't be me, and that's the thing about every artist is individual, is unique. They have their own ideas, they have their own technique, they have their own style, you know. And you know, you can copy people's style and stuff, but still, you're gonna know the difference between someone, one, one artist and another artist. Yeah, so here I'm just adding in, I'm just playing around with the, the design, really it's, this is just refinement of the design, before I go to colour, I just refined everything, you know, I've added the water in the background, well, painted over it now, <laughs> I didn't like it for some reason, it wasn't up to my standard, but, um, you know, it's just really important to refine your, your concept design, here I'm, I'm supposed I'm suggesting shadows, you know, the foreground element on the left is very dark, We've got, I'm suggesting the shadows in the mountains. Where will the shadows fall on these mountains? So. You know, a lot of people, um, I suppose, think that it's not good to paint in grayscale. It's, you know, it's better to go straight to color. You know, I, I will sometimes go straight to color. Sometimes I do grayscale. But I find that we've, um, with environments, it is. It just depends. It, it really depends on the painting. Sometimes, it just if I'm doing a whole bunch of thumbnails, I will go. I will start them all in black and white. But again, if it's character design or if it's an environment, a landscape painting, where I'm like, you know, I already know the palette I'm going for, and it's really, you know, like someone says to me, oh, you know, it has to be these colours, you know, and. Um, You know, I'll use that palette. So that's when, you know, if someone comes to me and says, hey, I want it to look like exactly like this landscape photo that I've taken, you know, and they come to me and I've got to make a painting based on that, um, I'll do it. You know, a lot of people get caught up in, oh, I'm going to do this design of black and white, or I'm going to do this in colour, you know. I say, do it in what works best in the scenario that you're working in.
but in this case, you know, we just I'm just refining the design, the black and white design, and um, you know, adding roots to the, the, the rocks and stuff like that. Really important to do all this sort of stuff. I'm sorry about the sound effects. If there's any sound effects, I'm just kind of playing playing around with a with a with a computer while I record this. Now, obviously, this isn't as fast as I paint. It's all sped up. So for those of you that don't know, if it is a sped up painting. And I hope you like. Yeah, so I think like round about this point is when I would send it to the director, definitely. Now, yeah, probably here. You can see the focus is this, you know, this Sphinx structure, this monolithic kind of thing, ancient thing, you know. But like, you know, hell, there's no real rules. You know, a lot of people get caught up in rules and they're like, oh, I should do it. Should I do it like this or should I do it like that? And I'm like, hey, whatever works for you. Don't stress over it. I don't know why my computer's making this sound. Apologies for that. Computers do that. So yeah, I've added in those islands. I kind of like part of the story. I don't know if you can see those little islands that I painted between that gate and between the, the Egyptian Sphinx head. Um, the whole idea is like, you know, how do you get there? You know, and maybe, you know, you hover up from island to island, you jump, you know, maybe you've got like a mount a dragon mount or you've got well I suppose it would be dragon it would be some sort of horse or lizard mount that like you know allows you to jump up or maybe you're a mage but you can only fly so high so you jump from rock to rock to get to inside that you know ancient structure and that's what I was but then I decided hey what about that gate it's just like a teleportal device you know and and you know those hovering islands are for really really strong um, really really good um, parkour people you know they, they can jump on them they can hang on the on the actual vines and, and climb up them because they're really good at parkour or like you know Conan the Barbarian style warrior can get up there but a mage just teleports through the teleportal door a dream mage but you know you've got this these bulky warriors that just like all these athletic thieves they, they kind of just you know climb up those vines so it's really important to kind of think of all this stuff when you're designing things what's the story how to now this, there's this hovering island, but what's it all about? You know, how do people actually get up there? I'm really lucky, like with Luminous Ages, it is a dreamscape. You know, it's a dream world. And you can get away with a lot of things. And because it's dream magic, you know, that's the benefit of fantasy. Um, and it's not because I'm lazy or anything, or because, you know, it's just easier. But I, I love fantasy, and I love surreal stuff. I mean, I'm a massive fan of David Bowie and The Labyrinth and big fan of The Neverending Story and just really well done fantasy, even The Lord of the Rings and, and I mean, I love Star Wars too, but that's got, Star Wars is fantasy and sci-fi, it's a form of fantasy and, um, yeah, so, you know, at the end of the day, um, it's about looking at this and going, hey, what can I do? You know what, what? What can I play with? What can I? What can I? I suppose come up with with fantasy. That's what I like about it. It's kind of limitless. Where science fiction has, I love science fiction too, but it has limits. You know, oh, robot can't do that. Robot can't be that smart. Or, you know, people, you know, are going to live on the planet for another hundred years. It's going to be dead. And, you know, what's the answer to that? Or, you know, this virus can't exist. Or telepathy can't happen because of this. You know, our brains are already fully developed. We already use, you know, 100% of our brain, so why would we have developed telepathic powers? And, you know, and that's the problem with, with sci-fi. Unless there's an element of fantasy, like Star Wars has that element of fantasy, to the force. You know, there's this magical universal force that allows the impossible to happen. You know, like mind control and 
and levitating things and, and telekinetic powers and ESP and all that sort of stuff. You know, the, the Force is the fantasy part, you know, of Star Wars. You have your spaceships and all that sort of stuff. Um, but anyway, I don't want to get on to Star Wars talk because that's coming out, so um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, so here, like you said, I'm just, I'm actually, this is where I'm working out the shadows. You know, where are the shadows falling? You know, the light hits top left, and so it's lighter on the bottom of those rocks. On the other right hand side, it's darker. And doing this saves you getting it right in black and white, doing a drawing or a pencil, painting everything in grayscale, getting it right. You know, color, just so you all know, color is only like 10% of the work. If you get, if you render a black and white image perfectly, photorealistically, you could just spend an hour glazing the color in using like a soft light layer and an overlay layer and, and a color layer and whatever to create your finished painting. Um, all your visual, all your information in an image is in a black and white image. You know, all your data basically is in the black and white. You know, color is only the, the black ten percent of data. Data. I mean, color is everything to a picture because it cre tells a story, it creates mood and everything. But color is only like ten percent of your of your actual image. You know, so it's really important to remember that. I see a lot of people getting caught up. You know, with that that theory. You know, look. You know, look at the best thing to do is look at a grayscale image and you can see like all the information is there you know you can convert an image to grayscale see it's all there and colors only the last bit you know even just start off with a grayscale picture right go get a fo uh, photo or, or whatever put it in grayscale mode and then go and glaze in color go and colorize it and you see hey look you know like trying you know i mean it'd be a bit of work but you, you could probably colorize a picture in a day you know half a day but you, the, the whole design of the painting is going to take you six days, you know, or whatever it takes you, you know, three or four days. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know. I think, you know, a lot of people, they want art now, 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 but, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's great to be able to do art now, 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 you know, I love that idea. Um, because, you know, I can go out and play or go spend time with friends or family and all that sort of stuff. But the reality is, Good quality art takes time, and a lot of people, a lot of students, are like, oh, you know, my paintings aren't there. I want it to be better and stuff. You know, I want to be faster and better at the same time. And I'm like, well, you can have one or the other. You can have faster, or you can have better when you're starting out. Um, and when I say better, you can paint things better, you know. And a lot of people, you know, get caught up with the whole speed issue. You know, I got to get this painting out fast. It's better to start at snail pace with um, with your art and produce really nice art versus doing things too fast and it just look really crappy. Um, but when I say snail pace, you know, don't take four months to get a painting done. You know, um, I mean, if it takes four months and you can sell an original for a thousand dollars, great. But um, you know. Limit yourself to a month on a painting, then maybe three weeks, and maybe two weeks, then maybe a week. But you know, a lot of people, um, you know, it's hard with art because you know life interferes and stuff. And even me as a full-time artist, you know, I have things like a business to run. So, and you know, emails and clients. So you know, I really have to block out certain things. You know, and uh, and one of them next year is social media. You know, I will still be on. At Facebook, and you can all message me on Facebook if you need to. Um, but Patreon is going to be the social media. You know, Patreon is going to be where I communicate with everyone. And it's import important to kind of realize where you want to spend your time as an artist. Um, you know, I'll still be on Facebook, but I've decided you know one or two posts a week is all I'm going to do because simply, otherwise, I'm wasting too much time on Facebook uh, chatting to people or you know, commenting on posts, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think once a week on Facebook is good, or twice. You know, twice a week when I'm at a con, you know, there's one day to tell people about things, and the other day to post an art. You know, tell people when I'm going to be at a convention, and the other day to post the latest painting or whatever. But we'll see, you know. 
Um, so we've got here, um, I'm just adding in the lighting, like really this is the bit, I love this chalky kind of bit, I was really, that eye on the left was getting too much attention. <laughs> Um, but you know it's it's fine to do that you know because I'm figuring out the lighting what is the most coolest lighting I can use for this you know a lot of people are like you know oh you should have stopped by now you should get onto color but you know I like playing around with this I like to play around with the design and figure out what I'm going to do and I said before but I think this is the point I'd send a black and white image to a to an editor. <laughs> this is the actual point. Um, and then I'll, sh I'll show you when I would send a colour image to an editor. If there's um, also, what I'm, you know, if there's anything that you all want to know, you know, foundations, you know, perspective or anything that you have a request for like if you message me on patreon like i do get on facebook sometimes and i can chat to you on facebook patreon is probably the best place for me to communicate by messages and through comments on on the forums and stuff but if if any of you um have like um ideas um like you know if there's something that you all really want to get as a digital painting tutorial preferably digital painting I do do traditional art, but it really is kind of, it's not hard, but it, it is a bit more technical for me to record my drawing process with traditional media um, because, it's, you know, it's harder to record it with a normal camera. Um, so, yeah. And, I mean, I, I am open to recording original drawings and I, and I will be doing that. That is definitely one of the things I'll be doing. But if you have any requests or anything, you want to know perspective, uh, lighting, uh, colour, anything I can teach. I can do a video on colour or whatever it is. Or it just might be, you know, how do you paint a dragon, you know? And we're going to probably cover that anyway. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say here apart from I'm just playing with the design. <laughs> I'm painting everything. And I'm just using a hard brush, I'm using a marquee tool, the selection tool. You know, that selection tool is so powerful. Like, you know, people that. There is benefits to digital painting, you know, and the benefit is that you can make really quick selections, you can work faster. You know, there's still a lot of work to do. You know, the, the, the flaw, the con for me with it being digi the digital artist, is you can zoom in a hundred times on a painting, like a thousand times zoomed in on a painting and keep on painting details. You can't do that with acrylic paints. And so that's where the extra time comes in creating digital art. And you can noodle a lot with digital, a lot digital, a lot more. You can sit there and go, yeah, I'm going to add a bit more clouds over here and um, keep on adding details into areas that no one's ever going to see. Um, some people notice it, some people don't. Some people don't care. <laughs> and so, yeah, all I'm using here is a hard brush. To take, um, I'm, I've got the dual brush setting with the brushes and I'm just applying uh, texture, you know, really quickly. And that's the benefit of a texture brush, you know, it allows you to kind of just add the, the, the suggestion of rock texture or whatever it is um, to your painting. You see here I've added, I basically added that rock texture to every single area and um, added lighting to all the area that I want. It's really funny because at this point, um, you can see the Sphinx really stands out with that white in the background because so you've got your, your whites behind the Sphinx and you've got your darkest darks in the Sphinx so it really pops out versus everything it kind of pops out but everything is still competing because of that white background that really really white background makes everything compete even the foreground rock competes um, so you kind of have to play like I had to basically push back the white in the background and put white into the actual the streams part. And by the way, I've recorded like about two hours of, of myself talking and this video is sped up. 
but I've also added extra video footage of me painting so you can see the detailing process at the end. Um, I record as much as I can. Obviously there's times when I, have, I can't record um, because I'm just painting deep, like I'm painting a rock, you know what I mean? And, or an area of rocks and that could take me like four hours and you know some of you may want to see this but I will speed that up or I'll cut out half of it or I'll only show one rock you know me zooming into one rock painting one rock I'm not going to show you how I paint every rock because I think you get really bored and looking at other professional DVDs like other people like with the Norman Workshop and Concept Art Org and Massive Black you know those guys um, they cut their DVDs to about two to three hours um, and they are sped up and um, and that's because otherwise I think you know, you're not going to learn. You're just going to get bored. You know, you're going to get bored hearing my voice for more than three hours. I think, you know, there's only so much. You know, like, what am I going to say? Hey, I painted another paint stroke. <laughs> hey, here's another paint stroke. You know, rather here, like, you know, in the two-hour sped-up process, I can go over the theory, I can go over the design, I can go over my painting techniques, and really kind of um, cover it all. So this is really cool because this textured brush kind of simulates a rock and it's all in my brushes that I give but you just go to dual brush so you have you have put up you create a hard brush and you click on shape dynamics and all that and that's it okay so here I'm at this point I just dumped a photo in because this is like the mood that I like and it's not I don't use that photo I also dumped a, a photo in the background um, in the in the you know in a river like I created I dumped in a photo and that gets painted out completely. I just start with this, but then I paint. I use it as just as a reference and guide. What would this look like? You know, like this is a test, a color test. And I don't use that those clouds. I don't use the, the ground plane, like those ground mountains. I paint. I, I use it. I use the design, but I paint over it and I repaint it completely um, with my own colors and stuff to make it fit the whole thing. So this is all happening, you know, I, I, and you can see, even though I dumped in the photo, I painted that in, I painted it in. So here's a whole bunch of references. This is where, this is how I do all my sketching phase. I've done some stuff uh, with a lot of artists from D&D. I've done workshops with them and talked with them, and, and we've got a lot of references for fantasy art. But I'm just pulling out all the photos, and this is where you just pull out photos and go, hey, what works better? You know, does this work better? And the photo isn't, you know, as a cheat, or it's not there to even use, as I'm not even using the photo in the work. I, don't, I, I use, I've used hardly no photos. If I've done any photos, I've added a little bit of texture in areas like moss, to save me painting every area of moss. But even so, even if I painted moss, I then grabbed a brush and put a brush on top. Um, I use a textured brush and painted over the whole thing. And you can do, you can actually achieve everything with textured brushes. People don't believe me, but you actually can create photorealism with a textured brush in Photoshop. You don't need a photo. But as you can see, I've added, I'm, I, these are all my references. I'm just looking at stuff, I'm looking at what works, what doesn't work. And I load up a whole bunch of references and I'm like, yeah, I like this castle, I like this guy, I like this. And, there's nothing wrong with using photos in your work. When I say using photo references in your work, not photos in your work, I mean, there's nothing wrong with putting photos in your work. But you can see, I've just like dumped that in. I'm like, hey, would this work? You know, and it's just it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe not. It's too dark, you know, pulling that out. Just adding a suggestion of, of that. And it worked, but it didn't. You know, I think I deleted it in the end. You know, I just added it as a texture. Um, and then I think I painted over it. And, you know, like, when I use references, you know, I look at, you know, the same time of day for a painting. Like, I look at many different photo references and I'll try and pick all the similar time of day and light direction. Um, but sometimes, like, if it's like I want a reference of the bird flying, it doesn't matter because I'm going to paint a bird in based on the lighting of my own painting. Or I need a reference on what does a wagon look like or what does a horse look like in this pose and I change the lighting based on my painting. If it's little things like that, uh, the lighting doesn't work out. But when you're creating fantasy art like this, um, references, you know, really help not to dump the photo in the painting. And, 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 and there's a lot of people that do that, and I do that as well for concept art when I'm working in film, the film industry. But, you know, the biggest thing is to remember is like, 
fantasy illustration is a combination of photorealism, photography, photorealism, and imagination. So when you've got a design like this, when you have a design like this, you know, you create your design, you use your imagination to create the design, but then you look at photos, a whole pile of photos. What photos can you use for the sky? What photos can you use for the foreground? What, for, what waterfall can I use for the midground? What uh, ancient structure can I use for the center, center part? What can I use for the right hand part? And, and so on and so forth. And I've seen that with like dragon designs, you know, a lot of fantasy artists will go, hey, what um, dragon can, I, when designing a dragon, what creatures can, I'm, I'm gonna use a lion's body, I'll use a lizard's, lizard's neck, and you know, wings, I'll use bat wings, and then I'll use snake head. And they amalgamate, they have to look at those references to amalgamate it. You can't just come up with that. You can come up with that in your head, but you have to have studied those things ages to really come up with that in your head. I hope that makes sense. So basically fantasy art is a combination of realism and, and a combination of imagination. You need to be able to harness the power of both, you know, <laughs> harness the power of it all. As you can see, I've got a whole bunch of textures. I don't, I just dump them in just to see what color palette works well. You know, sometimes it's like, yeah, this works well, or this doesn't work well. <coughs> I really like those rocks. Um, there's something about that. I think it's the moss, and I just dump the moss in there just to see what would this look like with a bit of moss in there. You know, and you know, it worked, but I don't, I deleted that after and painted that all. You know, I'm just like, yeah, this kind of works. Let's, let's do this. <laughs> but this whole piece gets painted in the end, you know. I don't know why I deleted it. I actually think it looks better with photos, you know, um, to be honest. Um, and I, I'm going to try a different technique next time, you know. I'll see what magic the flattering like. Call it magic, magic the gathering, magic the flattering. I love, I love, I love that game, and I love the art that's in that. You know, there's a lot of they're using, you know, a lot of great artists internationally. So this is like I would send like a rough of this with a bit of color now. Once I've got it, I've textured in all the color in the area with photo textures. I would actually send that to a director and say, hey, what do you think of this? This is what I'm proposing. It's not going to be photo kit bash. It's not going to be photos. In it. I'm going to paint all this. This is this is what I, I want to do. You know, and then. People be like, director will go, yeah, I love it, or I like it, but change this, or not, I totally hate it, but, um, sorry, that's my phone again. Bloody Lord of the Rings. Anyway, I'll turn off the phone. The phone's gone for today. I know it's that bloody Lord of the Rings. I love Lord of the Rings, so it's all good. Yeah, so it's just like, yeah, what would it look like if I added water like that? And like, looking at this, you know, there's, there's so many versions of art that you can make, it's not funny. You, know, you can go in there and go, hey, I'm gonna do a do kit bash version, or I'm doing a digital painted version. And then some of these photos are my photos, or some of them, like, from holidays and that, some of them are just stuck on the net, you know? And I like this river here, this lake in the distance. I want to have a bit of that. I think that's the only photo picture I kind of keep. But the levels on it are all wrong. You have to kind of pull out the blacks on that. You have to go levels adjustment and drag out the black. Like I said, this, you know, we're not, this rough concept, you know, would take me a day to get to this point. And it'd be, there'd be photo elements in there, but I paint over the photo. Like, as you can see, I'm painting over everything now. And I'd send this, you know, once all the photos are in, I'd send it to a director and say, look, mate, this is what I've got. Can we go with this? And he'd say, yes, go for it. Go for gold, Anthony. He'd say, no, nah, I want you to paint all of that. Show it to me again, but paint it all. You know, and it's just the way it is, you know. 
With illustration, I try and stick to making sure it's all painted as much as possible. When I'm doing concert design, like for games or films, I use a lot of these photo bashing techniques in my work. And, you know, I'm not a purist at any means. I used to be. I used to paint with acrylics and be like, no, nah, I want to, you know, all my art's going to be, uh, you know, acrylic painting and stuff. But now I've kind of gone 50-50. I do original still, I do a lot of original drawings and acrylic paintings, but I'd say it's 50-50, I mean, and sometimes it's, it just depends on how busy I am, you know, the, that week I've got all this digital painting, all these clients and all these jobs on, I'm like going to be doing all digital art. If someone's ordered an original painting, then, you know, different story. joy of art and design so yeah I'm just grabbing photos and you know you see the final piece it doesn't have any of these photos at all in it I don't know why I did this I think I was just in a rush I think it was in a rush just before I, I went to um, New Zealand I was like hey I'm just gonna this is before New Zealand so before I was inspired and then you see the after when I get back to New Zealand I start painting it all I'm like actually yep yeah, None of this is going to have photos in it. I'm going to get rid of that background. I'm going to paint all my clouds in. You know, and you see, I've got all these references will come up with all the photos that I pulled out. Um, I really recommend these photo references. Some of these were found online. I really, and I found them from New Zealand on, on when I did Google searches. But I really recommend you taking photos, doing your own photo references, doing your own research, going out to places, getting as much references as you can um, a lot of people don't do that they kind of just like oh, I'm gonna just steal stuff off the net I really recommend getting as much references taking photos I mean photography is one of my biggest hobbies so um, I will take photos if I ever go bush walking or whatever I got like a little uh, backpack for hiking and stuff and I just chuck my camera in the back and I go walking and I've got my water bottle and everything in there, I've got a sketchbook. It's just like the most, it's a little Kathmandu bag, it's for hiking and stuff. It's got everything in it and it's the best, you know. It is the best. So here I'm just looking at like, you know, structures and rocks and stuff that I'm putting in. It's funny because like, it's not, I mean, it wasn't done for nothing. It was good for me to see and test this this work. But, you know, when I change it, if you have a look at that Sphinx as well, that is actually a photo that I put in of Sphinx, but I painted, I painted it all, painted it on top of it, I repainted it all again. It's amazing how like, going from this to the actual different version, how much it changes as a painterly piece, you know, and you saw like I, I did a rough, the whole rough was painted, but here I'm just adding in photos and like, what would it look like if it was like this, you know, that changes, that becomes a bush, you know, big, well, not a bush, but like a little forest on top of it, you know, I found an amazing island, um, or like a structure that looked like an island in New Zealand, so I used that instead of this. I've also kind of realised as an artist, like, it's really important to take the weekend off or take, you know, holidays as well and travel. But, you know, weekends you can get away for a weekend, you can travel somewhere, you can take photos. It's really important to experience the world, see people, meet people. Um, I don't know if it's paused here. No, it's still going. Um, because this that will make your art better. Um, like this piece is really good, but after New Zealand, um, I really, it, you can see it changes from this photo bashing thing with lots of rocks and stuff, it changes to this amazing waterfall, paradise kind of piece of art, and the clouds change and everything, and it just looks more dramatic. Um, I mean, I think it looks better, you know, you might disagree. That's fine, you're allowed to disagree, it's a free world. 
Um, but yeah, just, I suppose for me, you know, I'm realizing, look, you know, if, if when con season's on, you know, I'll probably work seven days a week, you know, or, you know, if I'm out of con, I'll probably take a holiday afterwards in that city and explore that city, or, um, go see something, you know, in Sydney or Queensland or whatever, but, or in New Zealand. But I think the important thing to realize as an artist is, there's a lot of artists that, you know, they work, 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 and I was like that for years. Um, but, you know, do, do five days of solid work, you know, five days of efficient painting of, of um, you know, I suppose hours of art where it's, you know, it's all productive, you know, you're not, you're not procrastinating, do, you know, 10 hours a day of really good quality work, and then take your weekend off. So a lot of people that work right through the weekend, a lot of artists that do that, and my advice is, it's fine, you can do that, but you're not gonna hold that up for long. You can, I mean, you can, some people can. I have, and I have done that. Um, and I could keep on going like that. You know, I, I actually have, I suppose, resistance, but, you know, your art does suffer, it, it loses its quality. But anyway, I'll stop telling you what to do. You do what you works for you. <laughs> Everyone's different. Everyone learns differently as well, so, you know, like these videos, I hope help a lot of people, but you might find that you learn from it, but you have to pause it or you have to, you know, maybe you need to, another form of learning to really pick up stuff, you know, art-wise. So here, all I'm doing is I'm just going, hey, I'm gonna whack a photo touch this, what does it look like? Um, I, don't, I actually think like this looks pretty horrible. Um, when you look at the finished piece, it's not where it was meant to be, you know. I actually then, I pull out other references when I get back and actually paint from them, I don't even dump any, hardly anything gets dumped in photo wise and I paint above everything. But I mean it doesn't look bad, but it's just a different direction, you know, and it's not the direction I really wanted to go in, I wanted to give it more of a digital, or a proper painted feel, you know, it looks like a real painting, not a, a map, this is more of a map painting, you know, this is some, or concept art for games or film, this, this is more of a map painting for say a film or a concept design for a video game but it's not a fantasy illustration you know and you really gotta when you're doing art you know concept art and illustration you really gotta work out what is this for you know what can I do I'm not saying there's a lot of fantasy illustrators that work for magic that get away with doing um, they say put photos in their work and you, but they do it so well that you don't even know that the photo is there um, and so my advice is, is paint everything as much as possible if you want to get into Magic the Gathering or Applebot or some of those big fantasy publishers or Dungeons and Dragons and all that. But when you're doing games and films, games and film concept design, use any techniques that you can to get ideas out as fast as possible and presentable as possible to directors. And I think at the end of the day, I just, you know, this is... Here, this is actually, this is the point, this point here, apart from the top right rocks, but around here, this is when I would send the colour rough to a film director, or a, a, a video game art director, I'd say, hey, Joe, or hey, Simon, check this out, what do you think? And then say, yeah, it's good, man, 
finish it off. Or they'd say, man, look, you know what? This isn't working. Scrap it. I'm sorry, dude. I'll pay you. Some people say they'll pay me. Some people just say they don't. <laughs> Most clients now say they'll pay me, even for this, up to this stage, and if they don't like it. And then I say, oh, look, can you do another one? I'll pay you for, to do another one. And I'm like, yeah, no worries, you know. Um, sometimes if it doesn't work out, you know, I'll do another design. I'll jump to another design straight away if a client wants me to. Oh, here we go. Here's the waterfall coming out of the mouth. Kind of looks cool there. It's amazing how, looking back at this work, how much it's kind of changed and progressed. Actually, I really like how the waterfalls are falling out. It's a lot more subtle and it's a lot smaller here. It, they end up becoming really big, the waterfalls themselves. Yeah, I really, to be honest, I actually prefer the smaller waterfall now. But, you know, I can always go back to it, but I, I think, for me, bigger is better, too. Bigger, the bigger waterfalls creates the focus that you need. i tell you what I like better now. Yeah, I like the final painting better. And there's a reason why. It looks like a real painting. <laughs> Has the drama and the lighting. So here I'm adding in all the waterfalls, as you can see this is just like suggesting where all the water is. Something about this, at this stage, it looks really cool. There is, there is like, you know, I like this version too, it's not, you know, but the final version that we end up with is, I suppose, more, more illustrative, more fantasy, it looks like a real painting, you know. It's got a lot more atmosphere, a lot more drama and lighting. And it has, you know, a lot of cool details in it. But But you know at this point this was like the lighting scenario in this is like I suppose sunset. You know, I was going for sunset and the problem was is is I really needed it to be a daytime scene. You know, I love doing night scenes and I do a lot of dark, moody kind of lighting, but it's time to, like, for me, with doing art, I really want to create, you know, you know, kind of different lighting scenarios, you know, like daytime or um, sunrise, sunset, you know, and part of it is creating a lot of day. Being The hardest thing is painting during, trying to create a daylight scenario is the hardest thing to paint. A lot of people think it's easy, but it's actually the hardest thing to create focal point. It's the hardest thing to create drama. It's the hardest thing to create great design is during daytime because everything's lit up. You can't create a focus when everything's lit up. Is if something sunset or it's nighttime or it's sunrise or it's in the late afternoon and it's the shadows are starting to fall, you can create a focal point. So here's me just playing around with the design, seeing what works better. I don't pick any of these. And for me, the daytime setting really works better for this because I'm trying to show you that all of these big mountains and, and fog and, and waterfalls and, you know, beautiful kind of scenery, kind of like, you know, being in New Zealand. So really the, the beauty of that country you're going to see it during the day, it's going to be hard to see, you know, an epic landscape during the night time. 
So you really have to play with that. See, so as you can see, I've deleted all the clouds. You know, I painted over it like I said I would, and I repainted clouds. That photo on the left that I've got up as a reference, this is how you paint from reference. I I started adding more details to the waterfalls, but I like the clouds on the left. Those clouds on the left in that photo, I'm looking at them like, that's the clouds, the type of clouds I want. Daytime, they're going to be really bright, they're going to be cumulus, they're going to be puffy, they're going to be floating, look like they're floating, you know, magical kind of clouds. And that's what we ended up doing, you know, and the clouds lead into the focal point as well. That was a quick paint. Wow. Shiden. We must have missed that bit. But that was all painted, by the way. So give me a round of applause. You see, because I'll be able to switch that layer on and off. But um, that was all painted, and I'm still painting in the clouds. So you can see here I'm painting in um, it all. And you can see I've got my reference. That's my reference photography. You're going to get um, my reference pack. Those of you that subscribe to this, get all the photos. So you can have a look at what photos that I use, the coolness of it. And yeah, so I'm painting from reference. I'm looking at those clouds. I'm going, I grab the widest whites. I grab the, um, the shadows. But the funny thing is, actually, it's so bright. Those clouds are so bright. They're drawing so much attention to them. They're pulling away from the Sphinx. And you look at it now, and I'm like, Wowzers, yeah. So I still kept the design and the, the style of the clouds. I kept, still kept the shadows and I painted those clouds, but I, I got rid of the whites with a levels adjustment. It's important to do that. Yeah, just painting those clouds really. Let's see, I've zoomed in on the cloud on the left. And you can see I'm not copying the cloud, but I'm looking at how does that cloud work? You know, I grab the soft brush and I go, I, I look at the, I pick the lightest lights in the cloud, I pick, I color pick the shadows in that cloud in the photo reference, and I just design my own cloud. And I've designed my cloud so that they, they, they lead into the Sphinx, you know, as you can see, I've painted more and more clouds. And the clouds really add, um, I suppose, they do add a bit of drama to the scene. They create this thing. So here I'm pulling out the waterfall. This is another waterfall that I got from New Zealand, and I'm painting that waterfall. I've got rid of those photo textures that I originally had, and I've painted everything. Um, I went in, and I like those colors, and I like the water, the color of the water, and the way the water falls down those moss rocks. And I painted all that in. You know, I used a textured brush, all types of textured brushes, and just went in and just went crazy with it. You know, in fact, like looking at this, at the final piece that you see, that you're going to see, um, it's pretty good. But like, if I, when I probably spend another day on it, you know, and I create a version that I'll probably take to Comic Con and I'll submit to Magic the Gathering. I'm going to add loads of color, loads more color than uh, even in the final version that you all see. Um, it is finished, you know, I finished it by the end of the month, but, you know, art sometimes is never really finished. Sometimes you just want to keep on dabbling on it, or, you know, Leonardo da Vinci never finished one of these, or he kept on painting his painting until he died, you know, a portrait until he died, because that's what he wanted to do. He really was obsessed with some piece of art. So there you go, I'm painting those moss rocks. See, 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 this is where, you know, I've, I've painted with my imagination, I've designed that whole scene, but I've grabbed every single photo reference that I've found that I, from my travels, and I've applied the references to the actual composition that I've designed myself. So I'm like, oh, okay, this is how a waterfall works down a mossy rock face. And I'm like, and this is how a mossy rock face looks like, you know? So it's really important to kind of go, this is what I'm going to do, you know, and grab the photo references for each bit. 
you know, if you like a river, then you grab this river. If you like those rocks, grab those rocks. And so I actually have, um, and I'm sorry if I've covered the painting, but um, that's it. That's the way I work. You know, I kind of have a painting, I work on a section, and I render up one section, then I go to the next, then I go to the next, and then to everything's rendered to a point where it looks really good. It's really funny because even at this point, I think the image is quite a strong and striking image. But, you know. There's only so much you can do. So here I'm just adding more details again to those clouds. So, and like I said, this is all painted now. Like everything I've done is painting. No, okay, I have still got those photos in there, but everything gets painted over again to give it a paint, a painted feel. Yeah, so here I'm painting in the rocks, I've paint, painted over the whole design and I picked the colour palette, you know, a daytime colour palette of a, of a, a river or rock or rocks and I basically said, hey, I'm going to use this colour palette, you know, and you saw the photo before, so it's just really important to kind of, you know, search for the right references. And it's funny because like, even at the end of the painting, the references, well, they didn't change, but I stumbled across another reference, you know, that, that helped me. And I'm going in here and I'm painting, I'm painting back the mountains, I'm painting in you know, snow, snow covered mountains, snow top mountains and painting in the right blues and texture to give it like, you know, a painted feel or, you know, just to detail it all up. It's really important.
So yeah, here I'm painting a pretty little rock. <laughs> now I'm just looking at the references and just applying the color palette to the rocks and, and the river and everything. You know, I'm using that color palette that's on the left and applying it to the ground to each rock, each surface so that it actually matches. Well, not matches, but it's, it's inspired by that photo. And the problem I find I face with this now is that because there's those really white, there's white, almost white, whitey, gray white rocks, the big issue, and there's white in those rocks as well, is they're competing for attention with the Sphinx, the main, the focal point. So what I do later on is I pull them back, I actually do a levels adjustment and I pull out the whites again, I, I drag the whites right down. And so I stick to like darks and grays on the right hand side. And just a suggestion of white in areas, highlights here and there in the water. You just gotta be careful with that. You know, a lot of people, you know, have issues. So here, there's, these are all the references that I was talking about, like there's heaps and heaps of references. Um, these are all from New Zealand, we're all going to get them. And I start to sound like a New Zealander now, New Zealand. <laughs> um, and these are, the, these are the exact references I used for the painting, to guide the painting. You know, this is that island that you just saw was for, um, you know, the middle plane, and you can see I'm looking at every single reference and like, okay, this is the colours that I would apply to this river, or these are the colours on the rocks, you know. You know, it's really, here I'm just basically painting the crap out of everything. There's no, you know, there's absolutely no shortcut, you know, to digital painting. People think, oh, you hit a button, that's it. You know, there are things that uh, speed you up. There are things that the difference with digital painting is it, it allows you to edit things, but the problem with it is you can sit there and edit for ages, like I said. So here I'm looking at that rock on the left, I'm like, hey, I'm going to make that all a tree behind the sphinx. It's like a big bush, you know, growing off a rock. And, um, you know, as you can see, I'm looking at that rock on the left, that island structure, the photo reference and I'm applying the colours and of the grass and the colours of the rock to the actual design, my actual central design. That's the palette that I want to go for for that daytime setting. Loads of fun.
So here I'm just painting in the Sphinx, the colours of the rocks. Like I want to make sure that the, 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 the Sphinx is actually similar colours to the greens and the, and the earthy tones that are in that. You know, so it's a matter of just going in and painting everything. As you saw before, it was a very white Sphinx. <laughs> here we've actually, you know, painted over the whole thing and started again and added in all the other earth, earthy colours. Same with the actual... Um, the whole the focal point, we've actually played around with it a lot. And like I said, there's absolutely no shortcut to digital painting. You know, a lot of people think, hey, I'm just gonna, you know, add a photo. Like, you know, when you do photo kit bashing, different story you know you can add a photo you can paint on top of it and that is a shortcut you know that's the reality of it is it is a shortcut you know um but when you are doing actual work you know when you have to do digital concept uh, digital illustration you don't have that luxury you know you kind of have to you know you can add a bit of photo texture to areas you know but it has to be so subtle that it's part of a painting and that's what it, that's that's what takes the time when you're making something, you know. And um, that's just the reality of it all. It's still a painting. Digital painting is still painting. And a lot of people don't realise that. They think, oh, you know, we're going to do this. It's just a button, it's just an edit, now it's not. It definitely is not. Okay, so just rendering all the details here. You know, I've used, I'm using the color palette from the photo, you know, to give me, you know, the right colors. And and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. And I am copying some of those rocks, you know. I'm not, as in copying and pasting, I'm actually copying the look of those rocks or the look of waterfalls, you know, looking at that, you know, looking at mist. How does actually mist work, you know? It's really important to, you know, not paint the reference but paint from the reference not copy the photo reference but mimic um the reference you know mimic how does a mist of a waterfall work mimic how does you know how do trees look with paintbrush tools you know mimic how does a rock look you know, don't copy the rock exactly that's a study and there's nothing wrong with doing studies but when you're doing applying it to a digital something that's from the imagination you know you're not you have to be able to say I know how rocks work you know I know how to paint a rock now it's a hard surface I need to do this to make the shadows look crisp it needs to have, crack, have cracks and it's the same you know I know how once you've painted so much clouds you can then paint from the reference. You don't have to copy the reference. You can go, well, I, you know, this is what a card looks at this time of day. Okay, I've got that on the side of my screen. I can now paint 
my cloud, my own version of that cloud because I know how the shadows work, I know how that works. Same with water, I know how water works. You can see this river comes to life because I understand, I look at the, I look at photo references of the river, I color pick some of the colors. I'm like, okay, well, river has to have deep shadows, it has to have highlights, has to have um, areas of foam and stuff like that, it has to have little specks of, and the specular highlights on the surface. And it has to have reflection. Water's, water is reflective, so it has to have reflective, reflective areas too. And that's why, you know, doing studies helps you to, to learn things, how things work. But then, once you've done those studies, you know how to paint those things, it becomes easier. And all you're doing, when you're looking for reference, you're just looking for reference so that you understand the time of day better. Or you you just want to look at the, you want to look at different shapes of, shape, shapes of rocks to make your, your work look different. You know, you want, want to know how a red rock looks versus a black rock. Or a pink rock if you're into pink rocks. I don't know. <laughs> and so, you know, don't, um, Don't forget that, you know, all this takes time, you know, like it's really cool too, like if you, sometimes the warm up to do a study of something, like spend half an hour and go, right, here's a photo, I'm going to copy this photo for a half an hour practice, you know, as a study, you know, this is what things look like, you know, every day you can do a half hour studies of, of environments, of landscape paintings. Um, and you know that way you you learn how to paint better so now it's really starting to come together i think like here it's got a painterly feel we've covered over any of the photos that i originally had before i went to new zealand i dumped in photos as a concept of the painting um so when i did when i put photo textures in at the start that was a concept of what i wanted to go for when I came back from a holiday, I had all these photos that I took and I used the photos as inspiration to paint a digital painting, a fantasy piece of art. And I'm not saying the photo kit bashing is a bad method. I use that all the time um, to do fast concepts and even to do finished illustrations. Sometimes I use like millions of photos to make everything look hyper realistic and I, and I paint and blend it and to the point where you don't know is it a painting, is it a photo, what is it, you know it's a map paint, it's called digital map, 2D digital map painting and those can take me weeks to do you know, and people think, oh, you know, it's just one photo no, it's like a million photos stitched together, painted blended and painted all together, maybe some 3D elements added to it 3D models Yeah, so just adding shadows to those clouds and depth so that it has a little more 3D. And again, I'm looking at photo references from overseas. This is actually, a, I don't want to lie here, this is actually a photo that Noel Bradley took. Um, and I, I, he's got a great, he's got, I've got a lot of photo references that I give to everyone, but he has a ton of, this is another one from Noel Bradley from Switzerland. Um, and he's got a ton of photos that he gives away for free and, um, I give it, I give mine away for free as part of my Patreon, but um, you know I'm going to start doing some free reference packs as well here and there as as I get time and you know more money to do it. <laughs> I want to give away some photos, but not all. You know, I, 
patrons, you guys, you get the special ones. <laughs> That's just between you and me. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Don't tell everyone that. Um, but yeah, I mean, these photos are great. Great um, sources of reference. I think it's kind of... I mean, it's good to give away photos, but I think photos are an art form too, so it's really a tricky one. Like, you know, I, I find it hard to... It's not that I... You know, I don't want to share what I've got. Like, I share my brushes, I share everything, you know, my tools, my presets in Photoshop, my settings, whatever. I share all that stuff and my knowledge. But I find photos are harder to give up for me because I believe I study photography as an art form in fine art. And I think that, you know, okay, yeah, everyone can be a photographer, anyone can do photography and all that. But, you know, there is, there's ways you can control the camera to give you a different effect or, you know, being in a certain location at a certain time and certain place, um, you know, you might catch a rainbow on this mountain where there's a waterfall and a bird flies by at the same time and you snap that photo. No one else can snap that. You, they have to be at the same time at the same place. And even if they are there at the same time at the same place taking the photo, they've got it from a different angle. So they've got a different version of your photo. Um, they've got a different from their point of view. So the reality with photography is that it is an art form. Um, and when I say I'm happy to give up stuff and I'm happy to give you guys stuff, you're still getting, you know, the really good stuff that I'm using in my painting. But there, there's going to be photos that I'm not going to give away to anyone because it's stuff that's personal. It might have me in there, but it might be like moments in time that mean a lot to me or that I've captured this rainbow I've captured this sunset and you know I was there with a friend you know or you know I was there alone but you know I had this great moment of of self-reflection and I don't want to share that photo with anyone I don't want to sell it I don't want to do anything I just want to use it in my painting and no one will ever know that it was from a photo but it's something like that and and that's cool you know I think it's good to keep some things as sacred, you know, um, especially with photography um, and even art. You know, sometimes you may want to create art and you don't want the world to see it. You know, I've got paintings, probably like, there's heaps of paintings I've done for clients that no one will ever see. And I'm not allowed to show them because they've been sold off. Um, and, you know, it's nothing wrong with that. You know, if you just want to create art and you don't want to sell it, you just want to do it. You know, you want to do it because you just want to, as a form of expression, but you don't want to be judged or you don't want to, to have it put it, you know, you don't want to put it online for anyone to see. That's fine. Do it. Anyway, so here, as you can see, I'm painting in that, that water, the river. But at the moment, it's still too bright and I dropped back that brightness because it is really competing with the Sphinx. And I do resolve it, folks. I do fix it up. Does get sold in the end. Lots of stuff, lots of fun stuff.
Yeah, so I really don't know what to say apart from I'm painting the water, I'm painting the clouds, I'm painting the waterfalls. Um, at the moment, the whole piece, um, there's a lot of blacks all over, and there still isn't any focus at all. Um, you know, you look at the Sphinx, but you're still looking at the foreground, you're still looking at the background, you're looking at those clouds, everything's competing for attention. So I do, and the benefit of painting in layers, the benefit is that I can grab those layers, I can adjust them, I can pull out the whites, I can pull out the blacks, I can adjust every single layer and keep on painting. I haven't lost the painting. I haven't, I don't need to make selections. I don't need to repaint edges because the edges are already clean. The good thing about painting in layers is you have total edge control. And when you're an artist, when you're painting pictures, Edge control is, a, is, is actually a term that you use in illustration and painting. Edge control, um, it doesn't just mean, okay, you know, I want to have sharp edges on every edge. Edge control is like, I want this to be soft. I want this to be sharp. I want this to be focused. I want this to be, so, I want this to be a soft edge. I want this to be hard edge. Um, and it's being able to control every part of that. You know, a lot of people, they kind of paint the whole painting in one layer, and that's good, but it's good to sometimes separate those things, because if you paint in one whole layer, and then you need to change things, you're kind of screwed, you know, you've got, got to make a selection again around the monster or around that rock, and then start to fix it, clean up the edge and paint over it again, and you've lost what you've done in the past, you, you may have painted a really good texture in that edge of that rock, but because you didn't save them in a different layer, you have to repaint that edge, clean up the edge and start over again. And that sucks, you know. Here I'm just doing like a colour adjustment, you know, playing around with the colour, what works better in the whole piece. And it changes a million times. Yeah, that's just a colour balance, just playing around with it. What works better, you know, do I add more blues, do I add more reds, do I add more yellows? You know, it's just a matter of choice at this stage. And, you know, you can do a colour balance, but really there's nothing like painting. You know, using, looking at photo references and saying, this is the colour palette I want. Or even looking at another painting, looking at another artist's work, and not copying their work, but going, I like that colour palette. What is it about it that's working? How can I apply that to my work? And there's nothing wrong with doing that. You know, as long as you're not copying their painting and, and flogging it off as your own, sometimes that's what you need to do to finish up a painting. You know, it's like, hey, I like that palette. I'm going to use it. You know, and you know, you're doing your own design. You know, you're still doing your own design. You're still doing your own painting. You know, it's but you're just applying their colour palette. You might like the way they use their night lighting or the way they use the day lighting. And that's just the reality of art, you know. There's no, there's no shame in doing that.
Yeah, just playing with different color balances, you know. Would it look better if everything's green? Would it look like better if there's more blue? Sometimes it's better go in and glaze the color directly. I think I did pick like, you know, I did do an overall color balance on the image to brighten it up. And like here, I think this is where I start to, um, I suppose, just play around with the hue and the saturation and, and making sure that everything fits. You know, at the moment the painting is overly saturated. You know, we have to desaturate it all. You know, the background mountains are too blue. You know, they're just so saturated that everything's it's still competing. You know, and when you're creating illustrations, it's always about you have to direct the viewer to things. You have to direct the viewer to the object you want them to look at. You know, you can't have a million objects that the people are focusing in on. And here I'm just playing with the levels. You know, as you can see, I pulled out the saturation on these background mountains. And the reason why I did that, you know, there's going to be less saturation as you saturation in color doesn't exist in in the background of of any photo or in reality because as things that disappear off in the past they're less saturated as things are in the foreground they have saturation color and, and hue and that's just how light works in the real world unfortunately hey look with fantasy painting you know maybe there are some limit things that you can kind of get away with but in this case you know you want believability too it's a thing you can have fantasy and, and go all out but sometimes you want to make things as believable as possible and here I'm just adding texture I just added in um, some moss texture to the scene with the textured brush and with some mi minor amount of photo texture painting in that and then I paint it on top of that and Blend it all in. Lots of fun. Oh, excuse me, it's getting late here. I stayed up late to do this video for y'all. Now I sound like a cowboy. Hey, your partner. Yeah, so here it's just adding more texture and more colour and more vibrancy to the whole thing. Nothing wrong with doing that. You know, the thing is, you can add um, dark colours. Like, you can add colours, but as soon as you start going towards the brights and you're putting brights with darks, then the attention is going to be drawn to that. You know, and, and here we're just pulling all the attention back to the focal point. Which is the Sphinx. And I do things like add magic effects. I, I do a color dodge and stuff at the end. I even, the waterfall on the left, I turned to blue, blue tones because it was becoming too, um, in focus with white. With white, it was creating that highlight. And you don't want to do that. You really don't want to do that.
Yeah, and like I said, I'm really here is painting, you know, just looking at the colours of those rocks and trying to mimic the design of those rocks and, you know, using it as, as reference to paint the focal point, which is the Sphinx in that. So I'm just adding in the details of shadows in those rocks, painting it in. You know, looking at, you know, what colours, what, what do rocks look like in that area, you know? And just using a texture brush to suggest um, leaves here, you know, like just a speckled brush creates that effect that, you know, it's the, the edge of the leaves or the highlights in the leaf. So here I've just, don't know what I did. For some reason it looks very blurred, the painting. It's not meant to be like this. Um, oh, there we go, starting to come together. So here I've just put a lot of shadows back into the scene and highlights and, and all that sort of stuff and it's almost like a different painting here. Well, no. I've gone in and I've started adding all the effects, like you know, all the the like the I suppose all the details, you know. Yeah, so I'm just playing around with the colours, you know. Um, maybe there's blue light reflecting in the wings and and there's, you know, green light as well reflecting and um, all sorts of stuff.
Yeah, yeah. So I don't know what to say other than this is the part where I'm rendering everything. <laughs> Seriously, don't know what to say. So I'm sorry. Um, at the end, I also just keep the video playing and, and the recording. Up. Here, I'm adding more earthy tones. That's what I'm doing into the thing because for a while it starts to get like um, very dark. The whole thing is very grey and black, um, and I change it so that it has more uh, earthy colours in it in the end. And I keep, and you'll see that I've, I keep recording of everything, how it all works at the end, and I just have the music playing, and you can actually just keep on watching it. And it's for you, you know, to keep on watching. That's basically what it's for. Yeah, so here I start adding, adding the energy like the uh, portal. There's a little portal where a magician hovers through and then there's, you know, the energy balls near the sphinx head. And that creates more focal point. You know, that, that sharpness really draws people in. Really, I think that's what really works for the piece. Um, the best is me, you know. That's just me. Yeah, so, you know, it's just about adding fog as well and adding different various color foggers and just white, you know, obviously it's going to be blue and reflect, like the fog reflects white, so there'd be like grays and blues in there as well. Um, it's one thing I learned from New Zealand, fog isn't always white, or the water, base of the waterfall isn't always white. You know, like here, like the idea was, hey, I'm going to add a rainbow in it, but at the moment, because it's kind of for Magic the Gathering and for my comic Luminous Age, you know, it's going to be a piece for Magic the Gathering. If I add a rainbow in there, it kind of gets too surreal. Um, and there has to be this dark, moody element to it. Not dark, but definitely has to have... Um, you can't have overly happy rainbow feel to it, you know. Nothing wrong with doing that, but just not the goal of this piece. It's supposed to be surreal and awe and surreal and awe inspiring. You know, we don't want it to be almost like an adventure from My Little Pony. So, um, and nothing wrong with that either. But that's not what we're shooting for. So here, here you can see I'm looking at those rocks and I'm like, okay, how do rocks work? You know, I'm looking at them and adding shadows and playing around with it, getting it right. You know, it just takes a lot of time in getting that right. Truly is amazing how things work. And so here I'm just adding the effects, you know, the color in a color dodge layer, and it's important to do that. You know, this is where this is the finishing touches. This is where it adds story. This is where we add more focus. And like you see how it goes, how how much more detail gets applied to it at the end, and how much color add, I add to it, and all that sort of stuff. But this this is the bit where how this is how we add focus. We actually add do that in the color dodge layer, you know. Really, really important, you know, because that creates that focal point. 
you know, let's add these magical effects. Why are these balls hovering? Who knows? Maybe these balls hover and they, they actually will, they actually, you know, rotate around that ancient structure. You know, it's an ancient mythical creature, kind of like the never ending story. I mean, you know, that's one of my biggest inspirations is the never ending story and Lord of the Rings, you know, big kind of fantasy structures, architectural structures. But I'm going for very surreal, ancient. I'm trying to draw from the cultures of the ancient Egyptians, the uh, Greeks, the Sumerians, and the Syrians, and even you know Ethiopian architecture and sculpture, African stuff as well. Because a lot of comics, it's heavily a lot of fantasies, very influenced by the West, but the West or it's in, fantasy, fantasy is influenced by the East. And I'm still going to have that in my comic too. It's still going to be the West and East, but I really want to make this a truly multicultural fantasy world, you know, inspired by that. Here I'm playing with light. I delete that in the end. I think it's too overpowering, as you can see, I've deleted it. Um, but I do still apply like hier I create like these hieroglyphics around the design, around each one of the, each one of those um, things. So. Um, and it's important to do so. Like, because adding those hieroglyphics creates that focal point that you need. And now it's starting to come together. Now this is pretty much finished. You know, I'm going in there and what I'm doing is I'm actually doing I'm actually doing the color range. I'm looking at the color range. You can do a color range adjustment under select and filter. And what it does is it allows you to go how much white have you got? How wide is your how wide are your whites? How dark are your darks? And I've gone through everything and every layer I'm like, yeah, this is too white. So I've still pulled back those clouds. This is where I actually pull back the clouds at the, towards the end. Um you know, and it's really important, you know, to do that, you know, to go, hey, I'm going to um, make sure that the clouds aren't too white and that there's enough shadows and there's enough blues in this. And um, apologies for that, that's just my side. <laughs> um, all sorts of interruptions all the time, all the time. And here it's just noodling, it's detailing everything, it's crisp making everything crisp, getting rid of stuff at the end, you know, getting rid of all those details, making those spikes look like spikes, you know, making those shadows look like shadows, you know, making those edges look really sharp. Um, but it's just, it just comes to the point where you're like, how, mu how much of this is pe are people going to notice? And maybe other artists will notice and directors will notice, but the public don't notice. You guys don't notice it. Or maybe you do, you know, I don't want to sound like you don't notice, but a lot of artists, other artists notice it. But it's just more, this, this is the point where you're kind of like, hmm, what am I to do, you know? And it's getting there. And it's pretty much there, you know, like here I'm just going and doing the last levels adjustments. It's really important to do that. It's really important to go in there and go, yeah, I like this. No, I don't like this. Here I'm adding more color to, you know, add more color range to it at the moment. You know, you see I continue on as well in the end. To make it better and better. But here I'm just adding, it's just adjustments, you know, adding colors, removing colors, adding more yellow, doing color balance on the whole image, you know, making it pop more. But this is pretty much it's safe to say this is the color palette, this is how it all ends end up looking and this is how I want it to look, you know, in the end. And this is what I'm happy with in the end, you know, this is, this is the part where I'm like, this is where I decide, yeah, finally this is it, 
Yeah, so here you see. But anyway, I basically let the whole painting, I continue on with the whole painting. You see, I'm going to let it play with music, but I'm going to talk for a little bit more. Um, and all I really do at the end is I make sure those hieroglyphics on the actual the energy hieroglyphics on the on the main statue they pop out more and I and I make them sharper in areas. Um, I add birds to the scene. I also add more colour variation to it as well. And what that means is I actually added more earthy colours in the main structure, reds and stuff. I add some yellows and oranges and stuff like that. And I really just went in and refined it. You see the last hour of this video is just me adding details, doing edits, cleaning things up. And this, like I said, there's, I'm just lost for words because there's nothing else to say apart from, hey, I painted this, I got rid of this, I added more stuff over here. And, um, and I always flip on the black and white, the saturation layer. It's, a, it's actually a black layer of saturation. Here I'm also looking at this, you have a look there, what I did there when the green came up, I actually did a um, view gamut range. And what gamut is, just to explain to you, gamut is like what colors are not going to print out. And it showed me some greens weren't, print, weren't going to print out, so I painted over those greens so that they actually did print out. But yeah, I don't know, apart from, basically all I do in the end is I add more color range, you know. This is before the final edits. You'll see there's more work to this. And I'm sorry that there's a thank you message there, but we'll add that at the end. But anyway, I'll keep on talking. Um, yeah, there's just heaps more stuff that I do. Um, you know, I add a whole bunch of textures, color, um, I suppose more grass, more information. And it's just, you know, add birds into the background, into the scene. And it's just a matter of adjusting all the colors and pulling out, making sure things have enough contrast and stuff like that. Because sometimes, you know, you just add too much stuff by accident, you know. It's all good. But anyway, I just wanted to thank you all. I'm just going to leave the video play um, with music. You can see what changes I do at the end. There is quite a few. Um, and I'm sorry if some bits have been skipped or whatever. It's just I've recorded as much as I can. This painting did take me a while. Like I said, it, it was a nine, ten day job. It was more than my character work. Environments for me take longer because I like to obsess over environments. I obsess over my character work as well, but I find characters are a lot easier than environments. Um, in in the respect that, okay, you know, you've got a full body that you're painting that takes up the whole page. You now, whereas an environment, you've got like so many structures, you've got people, you've got a lot of things to worry about. Um, and the lighting and the, and the mood and all that sort of stuff. And those things do have, come into play with character designs, but you have different, you can get away with a lot of things with characters, whereas you can't with a landscape. Um, but yeah, again, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, hopefully my, my tips or my, my actual talking has helped. Hopefully watching this video has helped you to see you know, how to, to use photo references. It's not about copying, it's about painting from the reference. Um, hopefully you've learnt um, how to play around with the design, how to go from grayscale to colour. Um, hopefully you've learnt um, how to detail and refine work and how to finish up a painting right up to the end. Um, I'm going to leave it to play. Again, thank you so much. Um, I'll do my best every month to make sure the videos have more and more content or more information um, and they get better and better. We're doing our best to make them better and better. Um, and uh, yeah, if you feel free to interact on the Patreon. Um, everyone's welcome to leave any comments or any requests or or say anything, you know, constructive, you know, anything that or anything you just want to say, hey, um, you know, you like this artwork or whatever, or you, you know, 
any requests and stuff as well. Um, but yeah, thank you for your support and um, I hope this was helpful. It was fun making this, I enjoyed it. I wish I had more time on it, as always <laughs> with art, you always wish you had more time. <laughs> but um, I think this is the first piece that I can probably say um, it is on the direction that I really want to go for fantasy painting, um, digital fantasy painting. It's definitely vision wise, it's, it's the vision for Luminous Ages, it's this you know, this awe-inspiring dream world and uh, it's definitely the painting style I want to go towards. Less less use of photo textures, more use of digital painting and, and giving it a painterly feel, you know, towards the style of Magic the Gathering and um, Dungeons and Dragons and that. And also culturally, it represents the cultures of, you know, ancient Egypt and ancient Greece um, and Syria and, 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 and I suppose the many landscapes that have travelled, you know. So, um, yeah, hope it was fun and um, see you in the next video. And yeah, if you have any anything you want to say on Patreon um, about art that you need help with or you just want to ask me, I'm always here. I always check the Patreon more than Facebook. Um, it's kind of my version of Facebook. And again, thank you so much and enjoy. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.